This is Quan, and today I will talk about our work, so-called proteogenomic integration reveals therapeutic targets in breast cancer xenografts. And this is a project I conducted uh, while I was at WashU in Dr. Leading's lab. Um, and this is a very collaborative project where uh, we at WashU did the bioinformatic analysis work, whereas uh, Dr. Matthew Ellis and Shen Kuan Li at the time at WashU as well uh, generated the breast cancer xenograft models. Dr. Stephen Carr at Broad and Philip Mertens generated the mass spectrometry data, which is a proteomics data that really empowered most of the analysis described within. And so let's dive into it. Why do proteomics? Well, we all know from the central dogma that DNA goes to RNA goes to protein. And protein is the one that executes a lot of the phenotype, which are the cellular machines that does a lot of work. And obviously, personalized medicine will have this caveat of precision medicine making a lot of inference. When you see a mutation, you kind of suspect things would pass down and then um, affect protein activity through some different ways to affect the phenotype. As biologists, we can appreciate that although we have made a lot of progress of knowing what happened in the middle, a lot of it are still black, black boxes. So that precision medicine based on only genomics data can be potentially problematic because we're not really observe some of the key players, uh, which are protein that's close to the phenotype. Another challenge here is that our therapies currently are mostly based on molecules at a protein level, whether it's a small molecule inhibitors where that's an antibody, they mostly target proteins. So obviously uh, we make inference based on DNA, assuming for example, some kinases went wrong and we really try to target that kinase protein. Obviously it would be more straightforward to observe that kinase or substrate at a protein level be able to target it and be able to say how that might change the phenotype. And so with that in mind, um, there is a big national consortium called the CPTAC, which is generating a lot of proteomics data to complement a lot of the genomics data we have from projects such as TCGA. So from TCGA, we know tumorous mutations, gene expressions, copy number, et cetera. Now, we also know a lot more about protein based on a lot of collaborative work in the CPTAC consortium between proteomics experts, clinicians, biology experts, computational experts. And that really gets us closer to knowing the functions and potentially finding drug targets for these tumors. So in power with this data generated by CPTAC, we want to ask what are the protein drug targets in individual breast cancer that we can best treat the patients with. So one way we thought about doing that is to conduct a proteomics and genomics integrated study of breast cancer xenografts. So what we did here was we extracted the tumor from the cancer patient and grafted them into immune deficient mice. So these are so called the patient-derived xenograft models. And with that, we can then generate a lot of these personalized model of the tumor in mice and have a lot of that tissue to do our genomic and proteomic analysis. Once you have this data, you can then use computational approach to find out what are best druggable driver events. When you have the druggable driver events, you can then design potential therapeutic options. And the great thing about having these personalized tumor models is that you can then first test that treatment option on the mice before you decide that drug is the best for a patient, a specific patient, as well as patients having that specific genomic and proteomic driver profiles. And so that's essentially what we did here. And so going back to the paper, um, we have a lot more describing that workflow here, looking at the mutation spectrum and the varying allele frequency of these xenograft here. I won't go into, look into specific protein markers, whether what they're observed at obviously mutation, gene expression, but also proteomics, uh, fossil proteomics level, and whether gene expression and protein are concordant for each of these markers as well as on the pathway level. 
And then we move on to talk about um, potential clustering of key gene expression and protein markers. So here we compare, for example, intrinsic subtype, which is important subtype in breast cancer defined by gene expression of these 50 genes with proteomic and phosphoproteomic clustering. And here is an important clustering done between the xenograft models and the human tumors. So we'll go into that in a little more detail. You can see better the slide here that these are the proteomic profile where each row is one of a protein marker that's selected and each column is one of our breast tumor sample. The ones that are marked are our xenograft models and the ones that are without text labels are human tumors. So we see that no matter they are xenograft tumors or human tumors, if they're the basal subtype, which is an intrinsic subtype, I just talked about a very important feature of breast cancer that uh, can predict prognosis among other things, is that the basal subtype really all cluster together. So that, that really means that, well, we've done a lot of QC to remove, for example, mouse specific peptide and potential stromal proteins. But once you've done that good QC, you'll see that the protein profile of the xenograft of the same subtype can really resemble that of the human tumors of that specific subtype. And that's encouraging news for us because that means if we identify proteomic markers of potential treatment targets in that xenograft, that may be a good target for human tumors of that specific subtypes as well. So you see that for basal subtype, you also see that for the luminal subtype, even a lot of the HER2 express subtype of breast cancers. And so after that, uh, we obviously want to go and identify the treatment target. And how we do that there is that, well, we first look at some pathway uh, level activation at the phosphoprotein level. But then we look specifically into druggable targets and whether we have overexpressed genes, overexpressed proteins, overexpressed fossil proteins at those expression levels. And when we have, for some of these examples, we also did IHC immunostaining to check whether those overexpressed markers we see in large scale proteomics data is also observed uh, through IHC or the tumors we have. And so with that, uh, we come up with this landscape of different xenografts. Each column is one xenograft and different genes. And we see that some of these markers were identified as overexpressed protein are also seen in humans. But let's dive into some examples here. Remember, we have 24 breast cancer xenografts. And so for a portion of them, we see potentially druggable mutation based on analysis most of these are actually picked through CA hotspot mutations. When we look into the copy number variation level, you see a similar percentage, but different kind of target lighting up. So a lot of these are actually HER2 amplification um, as copy number vari variation targets, drug targets. And at gene expression level, you expand that number of targets. And a protein, a fossil protein, you even further expand that number of targets. So this tells us it's important to also consider protein because you may be able to see drug targets that may not be ob as obvious in the gene expression level or are just not there. Maybe some uh, post-transcriptional mechanism upregulate some of the protein or phosphoprotein, and it might be a good drug target for those individual breast cancers. So we see a lot of these targets in the PI3 kinase pathway. So let's dive into that a little bit. We know that this pathway is triggered by tyrosine kinase receptor by the growth factor, which then activates PI3 kinases, which then activates AKT. This reaction is repressed by P10, a tumor suppressor, but AKT then in turn activates mTOR, triggers downstream uh, other transcription factors that activates gene expression that really leads to the pathways that signals cell proliferation, survival that leads to tumor phenotype. Along this pathway, we observe tumors with potential druggable targets. The mutations, copy number variations, we see a bunch in PIK3CA, uh, well-known kinase that's mutated, sometimes amplified breast cancer. But for its downstream targets, we also see some of them have overexpressed AKT proteins, and a couple of them have overexpressed mTOR. So this enable us to come up with a few treatment hypotheses for these xenograft tumors. Maybe targeting this pathway would be a good 
treatment option. And uh, we are also able to test these treatment hypotheses because pic 3 ca hotspot mutation has been known and a lot of uh, PI3 kinase inhibitors or other inhibitors of this pathway have been actively developed. So we can use this to potentially uh, look into our treatment hypothesis. So we show more of that data uh, down here where we look into where those markers are validated and what the treatment really looks like uh, for HER2 as well as for this PI3 kinase pathway. I will dive into a couple of these examples a little more. But you can see that um, for these two xenografts, I'm going to tell a tale of two xenografts. And they both have pic 3 ca hotspot mutation. For both of them, uh, they were treated uh, by Dr. Shenkuan Li with PI3 kinase inhibitor, as well as mTOR inhibitor, as well as the dual inhibitor treatment. However, it's interesting to see that the Xenograph 16 almost did not respond to any of these treatments, although it does have a pic 3 ca hotspot mutation. Xenograph 20, on the other hand, respond to either of a treatment, and when a dual treatment is applied, the tumor is almost stagnant in mice. And so what's different between these two xenografts that may have resulted in these two treatment response? Well, on the genomic level, they look potentially similar, but on the proteomic level, you see that xenograft 16 has no change in AKT protein or phosphoprotein level, whereas xenograft 20 have increased AKT protein as well as phosphoprotein. And so that, obviously, we only have two samples, actually three in the manuscript, that kind of inhibits us to make a statistically significant conclusion. But it might be an indicator that we might want to look more into the AKT protein as a marker for predicting treatment response to PI3 kinase inhibitors or other inhibitors of this pathway. And this kind of is further supported by a previous report that picked we say hop spot mutation does not predict treatment response to inhibitors of this pathway that well. To conclude, I want to bring us back to this paradigm where we can generate a lot of these xenograph or personalized tumor model, where that's xenograph organoids, and then do genomics and proteomics using sequencing and mass spectrometry technologies. Using this data, we can then use computational approach to find druggable driver events, design personalized therapies, that can be tested in these xenograft or organoid personalized medicine models before we decide that it will work best for that patient and patients with a similar genomic and proteomic profile. And a lot of ongoing projects, including PDXNet, um, some different projects in H10 might help further establish this paradigm and help us improve personalized medicine in this manner. And so with that, obviously, you can tell it's a very collaborative work. Uh, I have a lot of co-authors to thank, um, and I hope you truly enjoy reading this paper. Hope that it helped you understand more about how we try to innovate in breast cancer, how we try to innovate in proteomics and genomics integration, and how we might use this approach to further our understanding of cancer as well as drug target, uh, drug treatment designs. Thank you.